All right. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for coming to the robots panel. Uh, we'll just go around and do some introductions first, uh, then we'll have a couple of quick demos, and then we'll start the discussion. So my name is Brian Hughes. Uh, I'm well, about to start a new job, so I won't talk about work stuff. That's kind of boring. But uh, So I am the lead organizer of the NodeBots SF meetup group. So we meet here in San Francisco. Thank you. And uh, so once a month, we have a meetup where everyone can come in, and we have like a themed hack around doing robots with JavaScript. So it's really awesome. You can check us out on uh, meetup.com. Uh, I'm also the uh, responsible for maintaining the Raspberry Pi support for the Johnny Five library, uh, which you know Cass talked about this morning in uh, her keynote. So Johnny Five is a Node.js library for doing all kinds of hardware stuff. So I do Raspberry Pi work there, and uh, yeah, I also do a lot of uh, Node.js stuff there too. I'm involved in the hardware working group, the inclusivity working group, Ooh. and uh, probably some more stuff coming up in the future too. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, I'm Cassandra. You're probably sick of seeing me on stage at this point. Um, I did uh, the keynote this morning. I, uh, I work at Auth0, um, using user management and identity management. I am a NodeBots author. I had a book come out in December called Learning JavaScript Robotics uh, from Pact Publishing. Uh, I do wearables, and yeah. So. Hey, uh, my name is Tomomi Mura. I'm actually, yeah, I wasn't originally to be here. I'm a substitute, so I'm totally unprepared. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so um, you might know me as a girly Mac on social media. I think people know that my handle better than my real name. So I'm actually a front-end engineer. I'm not really a hardware person up until like last year sometimes, and I started hacking around with Raspberry Pi and Arduino, and I find it's really fun. Then I you know, discovered Johnny Five. It was like, wow to me, you know, because uh, I don't like it, you know, writing C and stuff, and you know, I'm a JavaScript person, so I really loved it. I totally hooked on it. So um, yeah, and I had a workshop uh, yesterday, and I am going to have a, another workshop tomorrow about Raspberry Pi. So it actually doesn't use, you know, Johnny Five or anything Node.js, but well, I'm going to mention about it anyways. So cool. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Alex Glo. I'm the hacker advocate at Hackster.io, which is a site for people to teach and learn electronics by sharing their hardware projects. Uh, I'm into EEG, robotics, uh, music, languages, and things like that, and the intersections thereof. Uh, I've been on the board of a couple of hackerspaces, including Noisebridge, which is where I used to run these bike lights workshops. Uh, and that's also how I first got involved in NodeBots. I think uh, we co-led, uh, Brian and I, a NodeBots smart bike lights, awesome custom RGB workshop. It was fantastic. It was awesome. My name is Nadine. I'm an engineer, and I do community outreach at Punch Through Design. And essentially, what we do is we make the Bean, which is a Bluetooth low energy product. And I'm more interested in interconnecting um, Bluetooth low energy devices or Bluetooth devices um, with mobile, for example, iOS or Android. And so a lot of my projects focus around there. Awesome. So we all have some uh, projects to show off. Uh, I'll go and do my demo first. So there's a thing that we like to do a lot of meetups, uh, if we ever have like a long hackathon, and this is called a sumo bot competition. And this is where people can build little robots that are on wheels, and we get two of them, we put them in a circle, and try and push each other out. It's just like sumo wrestling. You know, it, it's a lot of fun, uh, and they're also pretty easy to build. I have one that's a little more advanced than the average one. So I have a controller. This right here, I, I probably can't see very well, but this is actually an old Atari controller. Uh, I had this Atari controller, and the plug had completely corroded away, so I couldn't use it you know, in an actual Atari. But I cut the end off and got this wired up to an Arduino, so I can now read off of an Atari controller, which is pretty awesome. And then the sumo bot itself is this thing right here. So I just have this little wooden container. Inside of this is a Raspberry Pi that's connected to Wi-Fi. So I have a node server running on my laptop here, or uh, a node client, and then a node server running on the Raspberry Pi, so I can send commands back and forth. And so whenever I take the controller, I can then have it drive around, which I probably just turn this thing off. It helps when you actually run the program, by the way. And there we go. 
So I can now drive this all around remotely. It's all battery powered. And yeah, I've done this in a few SumoBot competitions before. And yeah, this is a, kind of the stuff that we will often create at our NodeBots hackathons. Uh, also, that brings up NodeBots Day. Uh, yes, yeah. so we have an event uh, once a year called NodeBots Day. And this is where all of the NodeBots groups around the country, or actually around the world even, I should say, on the exact same day, we have a day-long hack event. And at this event, we, you know, we have people that build all sorts of fun things. So you, there's stuff like this, building sumo, sumo bots. Uh, if you're really new to it, there's usually people who will do like an introduction to programming, which is awesome as well. And yeah, so it's a lot of fun. It's usually in the middle of summer, and keep an eye out. Uh, for those of you in San Francisco, just follow us on NodeBots SF, and we'll talk about the SF events. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but Australia has decided July 27th. July I don't 27th. know about anybody else, but Australia, <laughs> uh, AJ already decided, at least Australia is doing uh, July 27th. But like you said, it's around the world, so even if you're not from San Francisco, um, your city probably has a chapter. Uh, I manage the Austin chapter, and uh, the New York chapter finally got around to joining us last year. And, um, so yeah, um, if you, even if you're not from San Francisco, check it out, um, and uh, there's probably a Nodebot Stay event near you. Um, so my demos, in case you missed the keynote this morning, are, are you ready for that? Oh. oh, sorry. No, you finish. <laughs> oh, so you got, okay, cool. Um, so my demo is uh, my clothes. Uh, my belt is connected to uh, the website forwardjs.nodebotanist. Um, and so is my jacket. And also my belt is connected to Twitter. So if you tweet at the hashtag nodesash with any CSS parsable color, including named colors, HSL, RGB, any of those, hex even, um, it will add the color to the queue. And so each of these eight rings represents a color in the queue. Uh, the jacket it has several modes. The one right now, it shows colors that were added by users from the website. However, if I take my little controller here, I can set it to this mode, which is based on an accelerometer uh, on the shield. And so the pitch and the roll of the controller sets the color of the hood and the sleeves respectively, so I can change that. And then I have what I call rainbow happy fun mode because rainbows are awesome. And in the bottom here, I have a mode, um, oh, it's not deciding to work today, is it? it might be disconnected. Um, how, um, what it is is a, an RGB color sensor. And if I can get it to actually show up today, nope. All right, usually, <laughs> apparently I have a bug in my code, uh, the RGB color sensor feeds uh, color into the photon, and the photon then turns all of the lights to the color detected by the RGB color sensor after using a gamma table to convert it back to human visible color. So, um, yeah, those, that's the jacket. And then, um, let me set that back to online mode, or reset it, that works too, I guess. And then, yeah, so those are my demos. All right. right. Oh, yeah. Have my panel reflex. So yeah, I don't have my demo with me because uh, actually my demo required real cats, so I can't really show it here. <laughs> the real reason is because I wasn't planning to. But anyway, so recently I have created something called Kitty Cam. Yeah, if you look it up, I have uh, some short YouTube videos and stuff too. And actually, I have an uh, open source, so it's in a GitHub repo too. So basically, what it does is uh, uh, it has a motion sensor attached to it. it's my Raspberry Pi, and uh, you know, sense the motion, right? And I set it up by uh, my cat's dish. So when my cat's approaching to the dish, you know, it sends the motion, then take the uh, photo. Then I'm using this uh, open source uh, cat facial detection called KittyDAR. So when the photo has a cat present, it's sent it to the cloud. So I can watch my cats eating while I was in, uh, I'm on the office. So that's really silly, but yeah, but check it out. Yeah, I have it on my GitHub. So if you look it up for KittyCam. So, yeah. Today I learned <laughs> that there is cat facial recognition software. <laughs> It works quite nicely. I did not yeah. know that existed <laughs> until right now. <laughs> Can we actually tune in and see your, your cat live streaming? Mm -hmm. Can we tune in and see your cat live streaming? 
Yeah. Awesome. I think so. Actually, no, because I took it off. No. So. Yeah, the thing is, I use uh, a duct tape, not duct tape, like a mailing tape to just put my pie on a wall. And, you know, it's been cold, so I've been using the heater, so the air gets oh. so dried off, so it just fell down. So it's no longer attached to the wall, so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, actually, it is available. I forgot the URL, so I'm going to get have GH pages, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah? Sweet. I totally want to see someone's because I've discovered that I can't even keep a plant alive. So if I can have any kind of interaction remotely with cats, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Maybe while I'm preparing. Uh, how about what we get set up? Uh, yeah. We have a laptop, so hypothetically we can actually get this cool. up yeah. and running, potentially. Yeah. Uh, while they're doing that, why don't you... Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so I tend to make uh, sort of more wearable type things. Um, in the past, I've made like EG responsive wings and stuff. My big one right now is that I've got a bike helmet. Uh, that works on the same principles of the uh, the smart bike lights, but this time they won't be thievable because I'll just take the helmet with me. So it's like robot cat ears that read your brain waves and do swivelly things. That's best based on the Neko Mimi you might have heard of. And then they've also got LEDs that uh, use a light blue bean um, and its accelerometer to like do brake lights uh, or turn signals if I rotate my head. But um, I've also got this uh, one-handed binary corded keyboard that's um, ideally going to help me not get carpal tunnel super early, but probably won't stop me. It's going to be a superpower, I don't know. <laughs> and then um, I also brought a little blinky uh, LED soldering thing, and that's less, uh, less computationally interesting. It's literally just the default blink sketch, but uh, made into a little uh, leaf pattern with the LEDs soldered together. You got there. So what I have here is the Dat Star, and essentially I use the bean and its program. It has a piezo buzzer inside, and whenever you move the the chip, essentially because there's an accelerometer built in, um, it will play uh, the sound from Star Wars. Hopefully, you guys can hear this. Can you guys hear it? It is indeed playing the Imperial March. We, we totally uh, promise. But if you're interested, come find me, and then you guys can kind of play with this. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, here, I'll toss this in and just send it back. <laughs> you could say you're awaiting the return of the Death Star. Huh? <laughs> I meant to say Return of the Jedi. I don't know why I messed that up. <laughs> it's good. Uh, Tony, if you want to talk about oh, yeah. this. So that's a still photo of my cat. <laughs> the one in the center. It's so cute, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like he knows he's being recorded and he's just like, stop. <laughs> like, just. He's like, you're really doing this. this. Like you're really life. filming me right now. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's adorable. Thank you. I actually really wanted to use a uh, like RFID or something to you know detect which cat, but I, unfortunately, I have only one cat because you know that was actually Brian's idea. You know, yeah, because uh, that scan the cat uh, microchips, right? You know, so. I do. I put the RFID chips on my sister's dogs. Mm -hmm. huh? So if they got near the bowl, like it should play like some noise or something to deter them uh -huh. from the cat food. Because right now my solution is put it where the dogs can't get it. But if I can get a solution where it would like buzz at them or something and scare them <laughs> off when they got near the cat bowl. Maybe there's dog facial recognition software. I don't know. Yeah, we, we so there's software that right? doesn't work for dogs. Yeah. I should dogs put RFID tougher, chips in my I think, all the different breeds. Place. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, RFID would be definitely be a way to do that. Yeah, definitely. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd have a tag for Batman and a tag for Bone and a tag for Ace. And if it wasn't Ace, it would lose like and <laughs> <laughs> Not like zap them, like make a noise. <laughs> not talking about zapping my sister. And then, of course, you know, we can come over and visit and, you know, kind of like take over the network and really start uh, <laughs> tormenting your dog. So, uh, that's a funny story. So, uh, I had to change my Wi-Fi SSID because it used to be no botanist until someone figured out where I lived and knocked on my door because my oh Wi-Fi SSD was no botanist. So, I'm like, well, that's changing right now. So, yeah, no, I've, I've had my share of uh, network intrusion. Yeah, don't name your uh, your Wi-Fi network or Twitter handle if you don't want to be found. That's what I learned. Oh, gosh. <laughs> good advice, good advice. It's actually really interesting in the light of the recent uh, articles that have come out regarding the U.S. government's approach to the Internet of Things as a potential surveillance uh, vector. Yeah. Uh, so do, do you guys build in uh, anything to protect people against being able to connect to your beans? Is, or do you have that planned for the future? 
Um, so with Bluetooth Low Energy, once you have an, a connection type of event, um, other, you know, essentially like uh, what you call central devices can't see the type of data that's being passed in. But obviously there needs to be more security. I think that's something that hopefully we should definitely focus on in the near future. I know that the particle, which is also a popular uh, platform to use with NodeBots or with uh, uh, Node.js, is um, it has an access token that you can change in case it gets compromised, in case you're doing a tutorial and you share your screen and everyone on the internet sees your access token. Mm -hmm. You can protect yourself that way. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, but it's interesting, you know, you know mentioning the, the particle specifically. Uh, whenever they had the first one came out, the, the Spark Core, this is their first device they made, uh, the security restriction was actually really uh, tight. Like, uh, for, as a developer, whenever you would go to program for the first time, you had to go through effectively this like registration process for the device, and you would claim it. And once you had claimed it, no one else could program that until you let it go. Which, yeah, it, it makes sense, I, I think. But at the same time, what happened at like a lot of conferences and things like this is, you know, people would use it, and then they would leave, and when you have these devices someone else claimed, we couldn't do anything about it. So, uh, so then, uh, it, you know, this is where like security and usability, you know, can really like contradict each other. And so for the next one, they actually set up so that just anyone could then go in and reclaim it, which you know makes it a lot easier to use. But then it, it's like, you know, what are the possibilities for you know security flaws with that? Someone could hijack my jacket or my belt pretty easily at that point, which I, uh, I've, I've put my own countermeasures around that. So uh, I basically have a JWT that like anytime it asks uh, the photon to do anything, including like reflashing it, it goes, if you don't have a JWT, bye bye. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Yeah, I have a friend uh, who uses LF LIFX bulbs in his house. And uh, whenever I, I go by there, I like stand outside and connect to the Wi-Fi network and like mess with his lighting patterns just because I can. It's yeah. like, it's not, and if you don't, if you have an unsecured Wi-Fi network and you've got lights, I mean, that's the pretty much easiest hack that you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've had friends troll each other with Chromecast because <laughs> they'll get on their friend's unsecured Wi-Fi network and they'll like play like, they'll rickroll each other on Chromecast. <laughs> I know with one thing with devices is you can uh, set a pin code, which is something you can do with the bean, and it's a six-digit pin code. So unless someone wants to connect your device, they have to enter that pin code. And if they don't have the right digits, well, obviously they can't connect. So I mean, that's one you know type of security that can probably be imp implemented by developers. I think that's going to be really important having the optional measures because if you have it, you know, you want to be able to saturate the market and whatever. And so people want to have convenience, and that's always going to be a selling point. People, like, usually that's how security fails, is people go for convenience over security. And so if you give them the option, at least then, you know, both parties who care more about convenience and who care more about uh, unhackability <laughs> will be uh, able to be satisfied. Especially because, like, it's starting to affect kids. Like, the whole VTech hack put, yeah. like, millions of kids' names out there in, in public knowledge. And it was just, like, that just made it an extra level of, like, terrifying is, like, the idea of, like, being a parent and buying a toy for your kid and then, like, oh, look, your kid's full name is on the Internet where totally. he wanted it to be. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah. So. Yeah, and so often it's, like, not even obvious that these devices are doing it by default. So, you know, there's, like, an education aspect to this, but there's also a bit of a disclosure aspect to this, I think, as well. You know, knowing what these, you know, consumer electronics that we buy are actually doing with our information as well. Uh, so uh, moving on a little bit from this, uh, let's actually kind of move to talk about uh, community and things like this. This is something that's been touched on a number of times throughout the day, I think. Uh, you know, you talked about, of course, in your keynote this morning, you know, very well. Uh, Miles had a talk uh, just before this about some uh, interesting community things with the Node.js uh, community. And so yeah, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit more. You know, what are some things you think that we're doing right, and what are some things that you think we could do better? Um, so the things I think we're doing right, um, again, it's, uh, we're, out, we're reaching out to communities, and we, we, we practice active inclusion. We don't just wait for people who don't look like us to show up to our events because that's not gonna get us anywhere. We go out and we find people that might even have the smallest inkling of interest and we say, come join us, come be part of this if you're interested. Um, I think another thing we do right is, I, I, I kinda touched on this, everyone enforces the code of conduct and node bots. Every single one of us recognizes that it is our job to make sure that this is enforced. Uh, there's no magic leader of node bots that that will boot people from Gitter. It's everyone's respective collective uh, 
you know, re responsibility to keep our community uh, in a good state. And I think that's one thing NodeBots in particular is doing really, really well at. And yeah, I don't really organize any events, but I do host some events. So I work at a company called PubNub, and we're located on Folsom Third in Soma. It's right by Moscone, right? So it's a really great location for you know people who's visiting a town for the conferences whatsoever. Well, many many people, many of us are working in the area too. So it's actually a good place to have a lot of events, including Notebooks Day. So we did have a Notebooks Day uh, SF last year in our office, and it was pretty cool. And my own approach, you know, uh, besides hosting event is, uh, so again, I told you in, initially, I'm a front end engineer, and I'm, I really don't have any background in electrical engineering and such, and I haven't really wired any, and I don't, I barely solder, I basically don't even know how. So I'm basically telling everybody, look, you know, even I could do this, you can do too, kind of approach, so yeah. A quick informal poll, raise your hand if you have formal electrical engineering training on this panel. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've been doing electronics for more than four years. See? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so, even I'll say, so I, have, I do have a background in this, but like doing like the, the JavaScript, uh, using JavaScript to program robotics, I, I'm like, I think two, two and a half years into that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still new to a number of aspects of this. Um. One thing that really impressed me about JSConf EU a few years ago is that they were using this process for selecting speakers where it was a blind selection process. So no one who was um, deciding who would be a speaker knew the names or pretty much any de demographic information about them. And they were trying to judge them using that method solely on the, uh, the, method, the, the merit of their uh, proposals and uh, what they were talking about. I know that merit is a sort of hot button word right now, but I think that this method works really well. And at the same time, they put out a lot of announcements in communities that usually don't uh, have much representation at the conference. And so by combining those two techniques, like reaching out to people who don't usually hear about these things and having a blind selection process, they managed to get a really good ratio of cool people. It was close to 50-50 gender-wise, wasn't it? Uh, as far as I understand, I wasn't able to go, but it sounded really, really effective. Yeah, I think I remember how they were they were split along gender lines, and they had a very good um, mix of non-white folks there. And that that was like that especially was something that just kind of stuck out in my mind as as progress, as something that we're moving forward. It's a I, great way. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, it's a great way to avoid any of those usual complaints of like, oh, you're just letting people in who aren't as good because you need tokenism or whatever. You know, it avoids all of that. Yeah, that double standard is always fun to deal with. Yeah, yeah and so with it, you just can't claim it. But it's it, like that outreach. It's like the, those two things together are what's necessary. You can't do one without the other. Uh, you, you know, if you do just a blind selection, but then you don't do any outreach, you know, you're still just going to get the usual candidates. So you, you kind of need to get out there and get speaking, uh, get talking with people, get people to apply. Uh, you know, on a much smaller scale with Nodebots SF, for example. So we don't do like a blind selection or anything like that. Uh, I just go ask people to <laughs> speak. Because you know we're niche enough, but you know I pay a lot of attention to like the diversity of speakers coming in, and uh, you know I skew very very heavily towards you know not cis white straight males, effectively. In fact, it's I've been doing this for about I think two years now, and we've had three cis white male speakers the whole time, and um, because once again I just kind of go pick whatever, and, and it's interesting to see the effect that this has had on attendees as well. Like you know we've seen the diversity stats of the attendees go up as well. So it's really important to have that you know representation for you know people on stage. I think. I think for me personally, I try to do a lot of outreach with either students or um, at different workshops, and you know try to cater projects to you know beginners and make them. For, um, more aware of how to do soldering and how a circuit works, and then from there build on the complexity of projects. So, for example, I like working with high school students. I probably will have a little workshop with Hackbright for people who want to come in on Sunday afternoons. Um, and it's the whole point is just to make it super friendly and have them be inspired to make their own projects or their own their own IoT products as well. So that actually segues pretty well to the next thing I want to talk you uh, talk about. You know, we've heard this mentioned a few times though today as well, and that's kind of the role that uh, education and documentation play in the success of projects as well. Uh, you know, there's this sort of like myth in programming that it's all about the code. You know, whoever writes the best code is who wins, but that's not really the reality of the situation. 
Uh, this is something that I, I think Miles mentioned in the previous talk. I had also heard is if we look at the jQuery library, you know, I think we all know jQuery. So here, here has used jQuery before, you know, yeah, pretty much everyone in the room, right? <laughs> uh, well, if you ask why that project succeeded, and in fact, John Resig, the, uh, the guy who created jQuery, he talked about this. He said jQuery succeeded because of the documentation and not the code. So. And, you know, I, I think you know we see this theme coming up, and, and you know how is this playing out in the hardware world? Is kind of my question to the panel. The platforms you see succeeding are the ones that are well documented. I mean, be that software or hardware. Um, I mean, uh, Punch Through and Particle have done amazing jobs documenting their platforms, and that's why they're doing well. Um, the fact is, uh, you can't get anywhere with Node bots with somebody if they think they can't do it. If you, if you just give someone a board and, and tell them, go build something, 95% uh, of the time, they're just going to put that board down and, and never touch it again because they think they can't. Um, documentation and education are the only reason NodeBots have seen any growth because we have to break that barrier, especially with folks who suffer from any confidence issues whatsoever. Um, breaking down that wall and saying, yes, you can do this. You are capable of this. In fact, you'd be kick-ass at it. Like, breaking down that wall is, is something that documentation and education are pivotal in, in helping. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's key to our success as a community and as platforms. Yeah, so it personally documents everything. Because, you know, sometimes, well, maybe I can say uh, that's, how, that's the way I learn. You know, I, you know, recording maybe software, hardware, it doesn't matter. I just, uh, you know, create something and write it down. Then I rewrite to make sure that everybody understand how I, you know, uh, how I worked on. So I did document everything about this uh, particular project, you know, the kitty cam too. So I have a GitHub and I have my own blog in girlymac.com. At the same time, I really love Hacks.io. And yeah, that's the way people can contribute to stuff and learn. I've learned a lot by looking at it actually. So we try, uh, we sort of involve people on both sides of the spectrum, or uh, all along the spectrum, from people who are very much beginners to people who are um, actually, uh, they have their own hardware platforms. And we try to create that interface because when you're creating a hardware platform, the, the community that you build is at least as important as the hardware that you do because that's all, everything that goes into the ease of use of the platform. Uh, and whether people will choose it. It doesn't matter if you have better features that, like slightly than another platform. If they have a much better community like Particle or like Lupine, then uh, they're going to do better. Uh, it's amazing. And uh, also there's this focus on autodidacticism. So like teaching yourself, uh, we have people also who are on the, uh, on the sort of transition from just doing DIY projects up to creating their own platforms for the first time. Uh, and a lot of them are self-taught, a lot of us are self-taught, and uh, I think that once you are ready to join an in-person community, that can be a great way to, for people to learn, like you learn from each other in person, but there's also this kind of gatekeeper culture among nerds, which is that you know, in order to enter a space like that, sometimes you prefer to have some prior experience or else you show up and you don't really know what to do, you don't really know how to talk to anyone, and there's occasionally gonna be that person who's like, uh, uh, making fun of you because you don't know anything basically about the subject. Even if you're curious, which is arguably your most valuable asset, you know, um, if you don't already have some experience, it can be really tough to get in there. So uh, having those resources available online is so important and it's so exciting that it's becoming so prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, so late December, I actually worked with a couple of hardware. I worked with Node MCU, Bluetooth, Adafruit, I think it's called EasyLink. And with, when I, while I was working with, on those projects, I was looking through the documentation because I was building, you know, some, I was building, you know, a, a prototype. And a good way to know how to do documentation is by going through other sites and seeing how their documentation is and seeing how you can make yours better or what you wish they had so that you knew that, so you, that you knew what the bug was or what you could have done better. And then, you know, you can try to put that in your own documentation. And so that was kind of the inspiration of us like creating good documentation because for some of those, it was really hard to find certain things to get it going, to get the hardware going. And if you didn't know this thing that you found in some thread in some forum that you, help, you happened to stumble across, you know, it wasn't an easy thing to find, you know. So for that, 
you know, for our documentation, we try to make it really clear about specific things that, you know, beginners would need to know. And as a moderator on the Bean Talk forum, for people who are like making fun of other people or who are saying they're newbies, I try to encourage, you know, that's a great question or that's, you know, let me point you to here and reach out if you have any more questions. Like definitely keep the language, you know, very encouraging, very inspiring. And for people who are kind of trolls on the forums, you know, try to talk to them privately to see if, you know, that environment, could, you know, could essentially be up, right, happy. It's interesting to, too to see the different types of documentation that work for different people. So some people learn very much by pictures and text and like uh, including you know, code, of, code schematics and bills of materials and things like that. And some people like to watch a video of someone going through it. Some people really can't do it unless they've got the thing in their hands. And uh, so it, finding creative ways to incorporate all of those and support all of those media in your documentation is very important. I think that Nodebus does a fantastic job of that. Yeah, and and also just understanding that there's different types of users, you know. So it's you know learning to have empathy for people at all kinds of different experience levels, and that and it's also I think very important to keep in mind that like people who write the code, people who are really really close to the code, uh, often usually aren't the best people to write a lot of the documentation. You know, it could be great for doing API docs, but you know API docs aren't the only thing in good documentation. You also need tutorials and examples and a lot of other things. Uh, and, and you know, having that sort of diversity of documentation that talks to different people at different experience levels is really, really important as well. Not to mention documentation helps you find bugs. Writing a tutorial is the easiest way to find a bug with a library. You write the tutorial app and all of a sudden, wait a minute, that doesn't do what I thought it would. So documentation can make your code better. It's a symbiotic relationship. So I think we've got five minutes left. Do we want to take questions from the audience? Um, yeah, let's do. Um, anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody? Or we can just keep talking. Oh, wait, there we go. We'll have two. Oh, have any of us programmed a drone? Uh, I have done a little work with node copters. So, yes, a little. Sort Same of. Same here, a little bit. Uh, also a little. Um, Nodecopter does have the ability to do some, like you can, you can code a slightly autonomous drone. Mine wasn't smart, but it was autonomous. Like it knew to launch, go four meters forward and then land again. Like it, no, by no means complex autonomy, but you know, some, some sort of autonomy. I did a fun little project with EEG where I hooked up a, uh, a NeuroSky MindFlex to some Pinocchio uh, wireless RF uh, mesh networked controllers, and uh, basically you, you would focus really hard or you would chill out really hard. The focusing works better for me anyway. And uh, <laughs> and then the copter would like fly up and like hit the ceiling and stuff because I had no speed control at that point. And so <laughs> definitely easier to do with the focusing than the relaxing. But um, so that was technically a drone because you know it wasn't human piloted and it was responding to the stimulus. But all I could really do was go up and down. It was really fun though. You can imagine like a carry moment where you're like frustrated and you look at the drone and it just flies up, hits the ceiling and combusts. <laughs> yeah, and it's like my cat. Good. I was flying my house and hit my cat. And <gasps> that cat, oh, poor kitty! <laughs> I've got scars from quadcopters. It's not good. <laughs> my cats always run away from the drones, so I got lucky with that yeah, one. Yeah. Sure <laughs> so, so you went out of control. <laughs> I haven't worked at this myself, but the 3D Robotics Smart Drone uh, has a pin out so that you can connect to an Arduino, and I'm excited to explore that. Oh, neat. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? Cool, we have like three right. minutes to talk about uh, all sorts of stuff. So, um. <laughs> right. uh, how about this? What's, just in a really briefly, what's the favorite, your most favorite project that you've worked on? Oh. Hoodie. So mine is, uh, I had an aquarium at home uh, with day and nighttime lighting systems, and it's controlled by a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I wouldn't say, yeah, the one I'm showing, yeah. But, um, yeah, I have to think about a new project then. Yeah. This is really tough. Can you go? <laughs> um, well, one of my current projects that I'm enjoying right now is I'm making um, basically like a card matching app, and that's connected to the bean. So whenever you shake the bean, because it has an accelerometer built in, it actually will reshuffle the deck. And I hope to kind of build on that in the future. And that would also be a tutorial I will be posting for people who want to learn iOS and integrating um, hardware with their iOS app. 
I think my next NodeBots project actually is going to be, uh, I built these Delta bots a long time ago uh, based on Jason Huggins' Tapster uh, blueprint that's open source. And uh, they play these stylophones, which are like little electronic keyboards. But I never finished programming them. And I think it'd be the perfect chance to hook them up to NodeBots and have them be dynamically programmable. It'd be fantastic. And have them do terrible sounding music. Imagine my, my, my next hypothetical project. I want to make a, a small quadcopter that travels the Earth. And when people say, well, actually, it just like <laughs> takes a little solenoid and bops them on the shin. Like, not enough to hurt, just enough to be like, whoa, what was that? Maybe people will stop going, well, actually, after that. You know, it's like this little bot just goes boink, like just knocks you on the shin. Just enough to make you think when you say, well, actually. Can it push the glasses up their nose? What? Can it push the glasses up their nose? That would that would emphasize their point. I think that would encourage that behavior. I want to yeah, I want to like enough. tone it down. However, <laughs> if someone says not cool in response, maybe then they'll push the glasses up. I'll have to, I'll have to work on that. Speech re speech recognition being what it is. Yeah, I think we need like fleets of these just going around like every conference out there. Yes, and then the German government catches it with an eagle because they're doing that yeah. now. Yep. Though eventually they would all end up in San Francisco. So metal. Yeah, this is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I love San Francisco. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're right. right out of time. Uh, yeah, I think we'll call it. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Yeah, y'all rock. All right.